Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, kind greetings from Chicago. I pray all on the Zoomcast are in good health and spirits. Uh, my name is Michael Murphy, and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola. And on behalf of our Hank Center staff, uh, Office Manager Patty Delgado, Graduate Assistant Adam High, and on behalf of Joan and Bill Hank and their family, whose generous endowment funds our many endeavors, I welcome you to our annual Teilhard de Chardin SJ Fellow in Catholic Studies Lecture, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, Taking the Roots of Our Traditions and Making for the Mountain, featuring our 2021-22 Teilhard Fellow, Professor Stephen Schlesser of the Society of Jesus, who's in our history uh, department here at Loyola. The Pierre Teilhard de Chardin SJ Fellowship in Catholic Studies is a visiting fellowship in the fall semester normally uh, for invite, invited scholars from across the disciplines and indeed from around the world. You can check our Teilhard page to see who we've had here. It's quite a list. Um, the, the work we try to um, engender and invite features uh, a broad range intersecting with the rich intellectual, artistic, and historical tradition of Roman Catholicism. Although Teilhard is not often the precise topic of our yearly lectures, his intellect and imagination inspire them in fundamental ways. Teilhard was a scientist mystic who developed a philosophy that married the science of the material world uh, with the sacred mysteries of Catholic theology, philosophy, and spirituality. Um, you know, but neither the Catholic Church oftentimes, nor even the scientific academy, um, often agreed with his constructive speculations, especially in the mid-century, uh, mid-20th century. As ever, uh, a prophet is rarely known in his or her own town or time. And Teilhard's writings have more lately been seen as prescient and even prophetic by figures as disparate as Marshall McLuhan and Pope uh, Benedict XVI, and even the creators of the World Wide Web. Um, Teilhard quite naturally and profoundly engaged his questions with all the resources at his disposal, with all the resources of being. And we think that's a great way to go. Father Schlesser's lecture draws on a Teilhardian spirit. We live in a period of fleeting change, Father Schlesser says, writes, whose lightness is nearly unbearable. In this lecture, Father Schlesser will explore the ways that we can retrieve and resource the Catholic intellectual heritage precisely as a living tradition so that we might creatively engender its innovative radiance and more. So from what elements of our traditions might we draw as we make for the mountain? What roots will sustain us? What materials, attitudes, and dispositions will we need? These are our questions today, and Father Schlesser has prepared a most enriching and encouraging lecture. So settle in, my friends. We are in for a most nourishing treat. Today's Zoomcast is classified as a meeting. This means the chat is restricted, uh, so please direct your questions or comments to me. As always, I will integrate them as best I can, and that's my promise to you to get as many folks in the water, many, as many voices uh, in play as possible. So I encourage you uh, to actively listen and to type as Father Schlesser presents so we can be ready to go at the appointed time. Um, the lecture is about 45 minutes and we will have 20 to 25 minutes for moderator questions, comment and audience Q&A. Thanks very much for that. So then, Let's welcome our 2021 Teilhard de Chardin SJ Fellow in Catholic Studies, Dr. Stephen Schlesser of the Society of Jesus with his talk, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, Taking the Roots of Our Traditions and Making for the Mountain. Thank you and good luck, Steve. As book two of Virgil's Aeneid concludes, the city of Troy has been destroyed. The past is finished. Nothing remains for Aeneas and his surviving followers. After great hesitation, Aeneas convinces his father they must leave. Aeneas puts his father on his back and flees the city with his wife, Creusa, his son, Ascanius, and many others. However, Creusa gets lost in the chaos, and Aeneas goes back to search for her, tragically, 
All that remains of her is her shade or spirit. Aeneas recounts, Three times I threw my arms around her neck, Three times her image fled my useless hands, Like weightless wind and dreams that flit away. The unbearable lightness of being. The conversation, however, is pivotal. Creusa's shade tells Aeneas that he must leave the past and move on. He has a destiny to be found and fulfilled, and so he returns to the many others, mothers, men in their best years and youths, massed pathetically for exile. When daylight arrives, it becomes even more clear that any remaining hope of returning to the past is illusory. The Greeks held every gate to the city. There was nothing left to help them. And so Aeneas poignantly concludes, I picked my father up and sought the mountains. This passage is deeply touching, and we could spend the rest of our time together unpacking it. But I've chosen it for a particular purpose. In April 2020, just as the pandemic's spread had triggered mid-March lockdowns, several Anglophone journals, including Commonweal here in the U.S., published Austin Ivory's interview with Pope Francis. This collaboration preceded and anticipated the larger one eight months later, resulting in the publication of Let Us Dream. In that April 2020 interview, Francis emphasized the need to remember, the importance of memory. After quoting Virgil in Latin, the Pope had, after all, a classical Jesuit humanities education, Francis commented, We need to recover our memory, because memory will come to our aid. We need to remember our roots, our tradition, which is packed full of memories. And he predictably recalled Ignatius Loyola's exercises, which he noted are completely taken up with remembering. It's a conversion through remembrance. The interview concluded with Francis returning once again to Virgil, to the end of Book Two of the Aeneid, which we've just seen. Francis glosses. Two paths lie before Aeneas, to remain there to weep and end his life, or to follow what was in his heart, to go up to the mountain and leave the war behind. It's a beautiful verse. I gave way to fate, and bearing my father on my shoulders, made for the mountain. Francis summed up, This is what we all have to do now, today, to take with us the roots of our traditions and make for the mountain. For an essay concurrently published on the British Jesuits Thinking Faith website, Ivory beautifully captured the Pope's paradox, remembering our future. Remembering our future, recovering our roots in order to move forward. The image of Aeneas at Troy gives poignant substance to a claim Francis has been making since he first assumed the papacy eight years ago. Enormous technological innovations, he has said, mean that humanity is experiencing a turning point, a time of epical change. Two years later, he made this claim more exact. And while the official Vatican website translation maintains the word play, epic of change, epical change, simpler English makes the point more clearly. We're not living an era of change, but a change of era. In short, we're like Aeneas at Troy. Two paths lie before us. We can remain, or we can take up our roots and make for the mountain. As Ivory underscores, the injunction is paradoxical. We must remember our future. This paradox shouldn't surprise us. Francis's thought is shot through with paradoxes. Massimo Borghese's illuminating account of Francis's intellectual journey underscores Francis's doctoral work on Romano Guardini's concept of polar opposites. Opposites must be kept in tension for creative novelty to emerge. Like polyhedrons, their unity is a complex one. Borghese also highlights the young Berholio's debt to his Jesuit elders, Gaston Fassard and Henri de Lubac. Fassard was a noted Hegelian whose uh, num numerous publications included a study of the 
dialectic of Ignatius' spiritual exercises. Henri de Lubac, later a cardinal, is pictured here, holding up his award-winning book on the prayer of Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit for whom this lecture is named. De Lubac was a long-time friend of Teilhard's, and an advocate for his thought long after his friend's death. Among de Lubac's numerous publications were several on paradoxes. De Lubac, finite human reason and infinite transcendent reality will always be in unresolved paradox. Paradox, says de Lubac, is the search or wait for a synthesis. It is the provisional expression of a view which remains incomplete, but whose orientation is ever towards fullness. The universe itself, our universe in growth, and there you have the fundamental point of his friend Teilhard, our universe in growth is paradoxical. The synthesis of the world has not yet been made. As each truth becomes better known, it opens up a fresh area for paradox. The connections between Gardini's polar opposites and de Lubac's paradoxes are probably clear. And paradoxes showed up just weeks ago when Commonweal published an English translation of Francis's introduction to a just published book in Italian on Catholic social thought. In that introduction, the Pope notes, Christian faith lives by a fascinating and compelling paradox, a word very dear to the Jesuit theologian, Henri de Lubac. Both de Lubac and Guardini frame the cosmic horizon, against which to read these lines from one of my favorite of Pope Francis's homilies. God is the Deus Semper Maior, the God ever greater, the God who always surprises us. Because of this, to be a Jesuit means to be a person of incomplete thought, of open thought, because he thinks always looking to the horizon, which is the ever greater glory of God, who ceaselessly surprises us. And this is the restlessness of our inner abyss, this holy and beautiful restlessness. The Pope's words were addressed to Jesuits at a mass for the titular feast of the Society of Jesus, but clearly they also apply to anyone whatsoever, religiously believing or not, who approaches the world as a paradoxical unity of opposites, finite human thought located within an infinitely or near infinitely unknown cosmos. The contrasting position would be what Charles Taylor has now classically termed the imminent frame, the box of four-dimensional, finite, time, space, energy, matter, in which we observe and reason. Francis's paradoxical vision exhorts us to remember our future. We are standing with Aeneas at Troy. We must take the roots and make for the mountain. This injunction seems especially appropriate as we commemorate this year with gratitude the 15th anniversary of the Joan and Bill Hanks Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage here at Loyola University Chicago. <clears throat> as Francis would say, heritage is not to be understood in an antiquarian way. He consistently insists that heritage should not be equated with a museum or mausoleum Rather, heritage is the extended living root system that makes possible the transplanting of a tree leaning into a future as yet unrealized environment. These reflections can seem overly abstract. Let me put some flesh on them with the help of some literary minds. <clears throat> Written in 1982, Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being will achieve its 40th birthday next year. It's long been a cornerstone of my personal canon and a favorite work with which to introduce students to basic metaphysical themes. The title is both familiar but also enigmatic. Enigmatic because it expresses a paradox. In theory, lightness, 
weightlessness ought to be easy to bear. A five pound bag of sugar is light. A 150 pound barbell might well be unbearable. It's heaviness, of course, that we would usually find unbearable. But when it comes to the paradox of being, things are different. It is the lightness, the apparent insignificance of it all, that becomes heavy. Patty Ann Rogers' poem, The Possible Suffering of a God During Creation, paints the problem with pathos. Think of the million, million dried stems of decaying dragonflies, the thousand, thousand leathery cavities of old toads, the mounds of cow's teeth, the tufts of torn fur, the contorted eyes, the broken feet, the rank, bloated odors, the fecund brown-haired mildews that are the result, the residue of his process. How can he tolerate knowing there is nothing else here on earth as bright and salty as blood spilled in the open? The contingent, the accidental, the ephemeral, the unexpected, the unrepeatable, the irreplaceable. Paradoxically, this is what human being finds unbearable. And so we attempt to add weight, to anchor fleeting things, to something lasting. Although thoroughly postmodern, Kundra reaches far back into pre-modern antiquity to set out his fundamental frame. On the one hand, he invokes Parmenides to represent the One. It does not change. It's unitary. It's reliable. It is Nietzsche's eternal return. On the other hand, Kundra invokes Heraclitus to represent the many. All is flux, learns every college student in Philosophy 101. Ponta Ray reads the t-shirt. You can't step into the same river twice. All is changing, fragmentary, utterly unreliable. All things must pass. Paradoxically, this constant perishing, as fleeting as the shade of Aeneas' wife Creusa, or as young Icarus, falling from the sky with barely a notice from bystanders, this blip against the nearly infinite horizon can feel unbearably insignificant. Kundra negotiates two things he cannot accept. He cannot accept Parmenides I, or Nietzsche's eternal return, or religion's eternal god. He is much too aware that existence is like the Latava River that flows through the heart of Prague, needing to be spanned by eighteen bridges. On the other hand, he also cannot reconcile himself to a world of only passing shadows. Einmal ist kein Mal, once is never, says Tomasz to himself. What happens but once, says the German adage, might as well not have happened at all. Not unlike Pope Francis, Kundra sees the need for roots, the need to root the flux in something deep and sturdy, to root the many in the one. Although Kundra cannot root the flux in an unchanging one, he settles for the long duration of remembered repetitions. The coincidences in our lives, the repeated coincidences, if we notice them, and for Kundera, noticing repeated coincidence is something of a moral imperative. Noticed coincidences become our lives' light motifs. And as these light motifs return, the same motifs, but in different contexts, our lives become like musical compositions. The many changing variations are different and unique throughout the years. Think, for example, 20 years of Thanksgiving dinners, or the recurring appearance of the bowler hat in changed context throughout Kundra's novel. But the returns are recognizable and unitary because they're rep repetitions of the same motifs. True, repetition is not forever. It's not an eternal return. But repetition recurs often enough to give substance and weight to our shadows. Memory provides the weight, paradoxically, that lightens the unbearable burden of being. That weight is the beauty that comes through remembrance. Kundra can seem arbitrary, 
Alfred North Whitehead, the British metaphysician who came to teach at Harvard, made it seem eminently systematic and necessary. Whitehead wrote about this negotiation between two poles not as a problem only for us finite humans, but the ultimate framework of existence. Whitehead's text, shot through with neologisms, makes for notoriously difficult reading. So it's very touching to come across this utterly unexpected, homespun aside. All metaphysics, says Whitehead, is an attempt to think philosophically about what was expressed with beautiful simplicity in an old Scottish Anglican hymn. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. Or think of Gerard Manley Hopkins's Wreck of the Deutschland. Hopkins first expresses his admiration for the creator of the Heracletean River, now reimagined as an ancient flood, the turn of the seasons, the unruly passions of the roiling sea, as well as the roiling of the human mind. I admire thee, master of the tides, of the your flood, of the year's fall. The recurb and the recovery of the gulf sides, the girth of it, and the wharf of it, and the wall, stanching, quenching ocean of a motionable mind. Then the imagery turns from slippery water to solid stone. Ground a being, and granite of it, past all grasp God, throned behind death, with a sovereignty that heeds, but hides, bodes, but abides. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. Kundra's vision of being's unbearable lightness plays itself out in the tumultuous relationship between Tomaj with his many and Teresa with her one. A repeated series of withdrawals and returns. Life as a rondo. Theme and variations. Paradox. The Catholic sacramental vision also preserves paradox. Denise Lebertov's sacramental vision owed a debt to Paul Claudel, the French Catholic revivalist literary figure. Lebertov encountered Claudel at least 30 years before her reception into the Catholic Church. We see this in her diary entry for New Year's Day, January 1st, 1959, a day that went down in history as the day Fidel Castro came to power, one year before John F. Kennedy would be elected the first Catholic American president. During the late December 1958 holidays, Lebertov had been reading Wallace Folley's recently published study of Claudel. She copied out notes by hand. Claudel, she noted, saw existence as an interplay between two primal elements. On the one hand, unending motion and becoming. On the other, primordial unity or oneness. In between these two poles lay a third element, the human spirit. This spirit alone, said Claudel, could comprehend something of the bond between the instability of the world and the stability of God. And this was the poet's human linguistic task, to name the perpetually perishing object in relation to what is unchanging. This, noted Lebertov, rescues it from its fate of disillusion. In other words, relating the changing object to the unchanging gives its weight, roots it, rescues it from the lightness of being. This is sacramentalism usually referred back to St. Augustine's definition, sacramentum et res, sign and reality a symbol of a sacred thing and a visible form of invisible grace. Taken broadly, this worldview envisions objects in the world as having Claudel's two elements. On the one hand, their visible material aspect, on the other, their invisible reality. This latter invisible reality is simply the creator. The outward material aspect available to the senses functions as a sign, a sacramentum. It points beyond itself 
to the divinizing action that it both embodies and effects. Baptismal water is water as well as divine cleansing. Eucharistic bread is bread as well as divine sustenance. This is sacramentalism, a creation that, while passing through limited temporal space, simultaneously carries the unlimited and uncreator, its absolute other. Levertov deployed this ancient vision in thoroughly contemporary terms. Her poem, City Psalm, was written sometime in what came to be known as the Long Hot Summer of 1964. Just half a year after the Kennedy assassination, that summer saw race riots explode in cities more than any time since 1919, right after the First World War. And the Gulf of Tonkin incident sparked the escalation of America's involvement in Vietnam. Levertov poured out her anguish. The killings continue. Each second, pain and misfortune extend themselves in the genetic chain. Injustice is done knowingly, and the air bears the dust of decayed hopes. This is a realist description, what Lebertov called the Midwestern common style that she had learned from William Carlos Williams, the American objectivist influenced pragmatic and sensuous longing for the here and now. Not coincidentally, that was the title of her first collection published in the United States, Here and Now. Lebertov might also have learned this realist description from the great naturalists like Emile Zola. Her phrase about the genetic chain echoes that naturalist sense of being crushed beneath nature's relentless cycles. But after this introduction, the tone turns into something quite different, a surrealist, perhaps, or even a supernaturalist, or even, like ancestors on her mother's side, a visionary. She glimpses something more, not behind, but within the phenomena. Yet breathing those fumes walking the thronged pavements among crippled lives, jackhammers raging, a parking lot painfully agleam in the May sun, I have seen. Not behind, but within, within the dull grief, blown grit, hideous, concrete facades, another grief, a gleam, as of dew, an abode of mercy, have heard not behind but within noise, a humming that drifted into a quiet smile. Levertov's vision is Claudel's, the search for a still center, not behind but within the heart of an unbearably ever-changing world. And yet it's way beyond Claudel, a symbolist who would have recoiled from clothing the still center in such harsh naturalist realism. But Libertov mistrusted herself, and she asked whether it was morally and intellectually legitimate to hope, yet alone express that hope artistically for things that transcended realism, things like beauty. The, Pope's, the, the poem's final lines seem intended to convince both readers and herself that her visions had not been mere illusions. Nothing was changed. All was revealed otherwise. Not that horror was not, not that the killings did not continue, not that I thought there was to be no more despair but that as if transparent all disclosed in otherness that was blessed, that was bliss. I saw paradise in the dust of the street. City Psalm was written five years after Lebertov's reading of Claudel via Folly. She would journey another 25 years before her eventual conversion to Catholicism in yet another eventful epic. 
the collapse of the Cold War. In the writers I have laid out so far, the main issue has been the transitoriness of existence and the need for something sturdy, something that abides to which to tether the passing. Annie Dillard's Holy the Firm, however, twists and turns this problem somewhat on its head. In Dillard, what ought to be sturdy is experienced as something utterly unreliable and absolutely distant. Dillard's framework exposes the potential for sacramentalism to become sentimentalism, illusory, and even idolatrous. In short, Dillard underscores the basic paradox at the heart of sacramentalism. In her exposition of day one, Dillard describes imminence with exuberance. In this tradition, scarcely different from pantheism, the world is emanation. God is in the thing, and eternally present here, if nowhere else. Dillard's language evokes Lebertov's earlier sensuous longing for the here and now. Day one exemplifies what we often mean by sacramentalism, attention to created beings as we experience and know them through our senses. This is what Catholics are known for, the sounds of the organ music, the plain chants, accompanied by hundreds of flickering candles, the smell of incense, the sound of coughing throats, bathed in light streaming in through stained glass. The scream of the newborn when the feel of cold holy water hits the baptized forehead. The taste of bread and wine, gestures of signs of the cross, and kissing of feet, painted plaster statues, accented with red blood. In mystical traditions, this is the via positiva, the positive way, a path of knowing, and talking about the Creator by using analogies with creation. It uses a cataphatic theological approach, assisted by images. It is the analogical and imagination. Analogical theology sees the world as a great chain of being. Beings participate in being. Creation participates in the Creator. And even after Adam's fall, creation remains good and is intelligible. Creation is not absurd. This line stretches, at least from the Neoplatonists through Thomas Aquinas, up to Shakespeare, the gateway to modernity. The great chain of being grounds natural law. So much argument here about what it means, about its particulars, but basically it is a conviction that <clears throat> human reason can discover connections between facts and values. This high estimation of reason is the dominant aspect of Catholicism, but its dominance ebbs and flows. It ebbs, as the late Sir Richard Southern once remarked, it ebbs not because it is too pessimistic about human reason, it ebbs because it's too optimistic. As many examples demonstrate, Catholicism often tends toward being overly presumptuous. Here's just one example. In 1866, the Holy Office of the Inquisition, today's CDF, responded to the inquiry of a bishop in Ethiopia with this instruction. Slavery itself, considered as such in its essential nature, is not at all contrary to the natural and divine law. And there can be several just titles of slavery, and these are referred to by approved theologians and commentators of the sacred canons. The date is chilling. It's one year after President Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address, and soon thereafter, assassination. Lincoln, at least agnostic, if not atheistic, nevertheless proposed that America's Civil War bloodbath was some kind of cosmic retribution for the evils of slavery. In this ethical juxtaposition, it would seem, the non-believer put the overly presumptuous Catholic teaching authority to shame. Catholicism's high estimation of nature, reason, and consequently human institutions 
can tend toward idolatry. For Aquinas, untempered optimism, presumption, is a moral vice. And one could make a case for presumption being a recurrent Catholic temptation. The innocent presumption in Dillard's Day 1 is followed by the tragic accident in Day 2. A plane falls from the sky and burns badly, little Julie Norwich. Her medieval anchoress namesake had written, All manner of things shall be well. But all is not well following this senseless burning of the innocent. Day two introduces the ancient tradition of absolute emanation. Emanating from God and linked to him by Christ, the world is yet infinitely other than God, furled away from him like the end of a long banner falling. What had been an optimistic great chain of being in day one becomes here in day two a vertical line of the world, a great chain of burning. In mystical tradition this is the via negativa, the negative way, the dark night of the soul of St. John of the Cross. This is apophatic theology, knowing God only through negation, only by being able to say what God is not. Abandon everything, said Dionysius. God despises ideas. This is the tradition of that little medieval classic written, appropriately enough, by an anonymous writer, The Cloud of Unknowing. We live, often enough, in a fog of war. Note the title of Lebertov's collection of last poems, This Great Unknowing. It's a long journey from here and now. In sacramental theology, this is the res, the pole opposite the sacramentum. The word simply means thing or reality, and here it means the divine, grace, or more plainly, God. It's at the opposite pole of creation. It's the creator. It's the holy other. Perhaps the bluntest formulation of this absolute distance of God is found in the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215. Lateran IV put the brakes on all of that optimistic realism I had just laid out for you. I mean, the heady over-optimism of the medieval scholastics, who believed we can use reason to understand everything, even God, by means of analogy. The Council wasted no words in its critique. Between creator and creature, it declared, no similitude can be expressed without implying a greater dissimilitude. In less turgid language, when using any analogy about God, the user must realize that any similarity perceived between the Creator and the Creature is outstretched by an even greater dissimilarity. Or more plainly, when we talk about God, just remember we really don't know what we're talking about. This is basically the same end point as the book of Job, written 15 centuries earlier. Anyone who denied this, declared the council, was to be, quote, rejected as a heretic. We tend to associate this extreme position with John Calvin and reformed Christianity. In order to preserve the absolute majesty and distance and freedom of God's will, Calvin opposed it to human will or merit. Calvinist iconoclasts attacked images, breaking stained glass windows, taking hammers to the heads and limbs of statues, and dragging others out to purifying fires. But it's worth recalling that Karl Rahner, the great German Jesuit theologian, preached in this same vein to his parishioners buried in the rubble, quite literally buried, after a Second World War. They'd been robbed of their comforting images, their expectations of a provident God in the total destruction that the Allied forces had rained down on Munich. And this loss was a good thing, said Rahner, paradoxically. In this occurrence of the heart, he preached, Let despair take everything from you. In truth, you will only lose the finite and the futile, no matter how great and wonderful it was, even if it is you yourself, 
you with your image of God which resembled you instead of the incomprehensible himself. Whatever can be taken from you is never God. This radical insistence on the absolute otherness of God is shared by the radical monotheism of the three religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But Catholicism's traditional fear is that an over-insistence on the distance of God and the uselessness of human effort and imagination leads to despair. And for the tradition articulated by Aquinas, despair, like its contrary presumption, is a moral vice. St. Augustine said it first, There are two kinds of things that kill the soul despair and false hope. In the Catholic worldview, imminence and emanation, sacramentum and res, must always be held together in tension. This is the essence of sacramentalism, and it is irreducibly paradoxical. Annie Dillard, lacking a third word in the tradition to complement imminence and emanation, calls this dynamic tension, this day three, wholly the firm. We live, she says, suspended, or sometimes torn apart, between the attractive weight of God's imminence and the terrifying weightlessness of God's eminence. This section opens with words echoing Job's, a taut statement of epistemological modesty. I know only enough of God to want to worship him, by any means ready to hand. In this third and final section, Dillard's prose turns progressively purple and increasingly inaccessible, and I say to my students, it's okay, don't sweat it. She's just telling you, with increasing incomprehension, you can't comprehend it. In the end, Holy the Firm is the virtue of hope, virtue being the middle way, the mean between extremes. Sacramentum leads to presumption. Res leads to despair. The unresolved paradox of sacramentum at res, held in dynamic tension, grounds hope. It's difficult to imagine paradox. Maybe it's impossible. I myself fall back on an image given by one of my best profs many years ago. Orthodoxy, he said, is like a game of squash. Orthodoxy is ceaseless motion. The ball must be kept in play between two limiting walls, and when the ball jumps the limits, flies out of bounds, severs the tension, the tradition calls that heterodoxy. But as long as the ball remains in play, the paradox remains. Holy the firm. John Berryman put day three in terms I absolutely love. Unknowable, as I am unknown to my guinea pigs. How can I love you? I only as far as gratitude and awe, confidently and absolutely go. Whatever your end may be, except my amazement. Gratitude, awe, amazement. Berryman leads me, finally, to Bynum, to Bynum and wonder. Carolyn Walker Bynum's presidential address for the American Historical Association has a simple title, Wonder. Bynum begins with a charming anecdote about graduate research in 1969 Paris. She recalls a student protest sign that became her personal manifesto, Toute vue de choses qui n'est pas étrange et fausse. Every view of things that is not strange or foreign is false. The student protester had borrowed the line from an essay by the French writer and philosopher Paul Valéry. Every view of things not strange or foreign is false. If something is real, it cannot help but lose some of its reality by becoming familiar. To meditate philosophically is to make a return from the familiar to the strange, and in the strange to encounter the real. In other words, the key to teaching philosophy, and perhaps all the humanities, as well as the sciences, 
is not so much to render familiar the unfamiliar as to return what has become overly familiar back to its original strangeness or foreignness. Bynum compiles a lexicon of medieval terms describing degrees of wonder as opposed to knowledge. Some terms imply that we can fully comprehend and assimilate something. For example, general categories or the usual, the not strange. But others imply that there are strange things that we can never fully comprehend. Wondrous things, wonderful things, resist our, attempt to, to, our attempts to comprehend, assimilate, fully digest, colonize, domesticate. Bynum then applies these ancient examples to present day contexts. I would argue that we write the best history when the specificity, the novelty, the awefulness of what our sources render up bowls us over with its complexity and its significance. Our research is better when we move only cautiously to understanding, when fear that we may appropriate the other leads us not so much to writing about ourselves and our fears as to crafting our stories with attentive, wondering care. At our best it is the strange view of things for which we strive, not least because, as Thomas Aquinas understood, admiratio has to do with teaching. Surely our job as teachers is to puzzle, confuse, and amaze. We must rear a new generation of students who will gaze in wonder at texts and artifacts, quick to puzzle over a translation, slow to project or to appropriate, quick to assume there is a significance, slow to generalize about it. Not only as scholars then, but also as teachers, we must astonish and be astonished. For amazement yearns toward an understanding a significance that is always just a little beyond both our theories and our fears. Every view of things that is not wonderful is false. In this change of era, Pope Francis calls for taking up roots of tradition and making for the mountain. This tradition is paradoxical, a never-ending tension, a polar opposites. The ultimate frame is open, not closed, transcendent as well as imminent. The paradox implies persons of incomplete thought, always keeping the ball in play. To be ast to astonish and to be astonished. To be amazed at what is always just a little bit beyond both our theories and our fears. Every view of things that is not wonderful is false. Well, thank you very much, Father Schlesser. Really appreciate it. So I'm hoping everybody can hear me back live now. And we're going to ask Father Schlesser to unmute uh, and um, show his face. And I want to apologize, you know, it's, I mean, what can you say? <laughs> it's a classic, you know, uh, I was thinking about Holy the Firm and Dillard uh, as we went through a tech difficulty. So there's something Holy the Firm about this, um, that the tech failed, uh, but Father Schlesser's voice rang true and became kind of an anchor as we kind of, you know, all too typically, um, you know, navigated those nefarious robots that, in, that come in the evening and, and take, you know, take over our, <laughs> our online lives. So, um, so Steve, uh, I can't see your square right now. I'm sure I probably will if you start speaking, but uh, you've given us so much. Uh, you know, we need proper time to digest. And I mean, I, I'm aware of that with the crowd. So maybe some, some people will uh, ask some questions as we speak. I have many advanced questions um, we had almost 700 registrants for this event. And um, I think people are hungry for what you are 
uh, which, which you are giving us, which you gave us. So let's, let's begin um, with the word on Teilhard. Uh, he's a thinker, a Jesuit. Um, I know you feel very close to intellectually and probably personally. Um, what do you think about, you know, Teilhard in light of your current thought, maybe your, maybe today's thoughts? But how, how, did, how did you think about Teilhard as you were preparing these remarks and as you got deeper into them? Uh, well, thanks. Um, so I have this little sign that says you cannot start your video because the host stopped it. So um, I'll need some help with that, I guess. Uh, so anyway, in the meantime, you know, the best laid plans here. Uh, yeah. So, um, yes, because a number of folks had asked about Teilhard in the pre-questions, um, I did want to kind of start with him. You know, he's not only wonderful in himself, fascinating to me in himself, but he really stands it as, a, as an exemplar of what I was uh, trying to talk about in the, in the talk. Um, so I really encourage a reading Steve, can you unmute yourself there? So sorry, everybody. Uh, we need Steve to unmute. Gosh, so sorry. Um, this is really unusual. I think this is our, our you know, nothing's perfect. We usually get, go off without a hitch here. Um, so we need to have Steve Slesser unmuted. I'm asking him to unmute here. And here he is. Thanks, okay. Steve. So we got, we got that one. I think they're working on the, uh, the video thing. Okay. So anyway, okay. Um, I really encourage a reading of Susan K. Sachs's book, Americans Tayard, Christ and Hope in the 60s. And I looked at it this morning and there's not a single star review on Amazon. So uh, it's, it might be a book that got lost in the pandemic. It was released in late March, 2019. Um, what I love about this book is that it looks at the reception of Teilhard in the U.S. between 1959 and 1972. And what she does is show us why Teilhard was so popular, but also why the popularity waned. So popular, uh, it was right after Sputnik, it was science, it was... Uh, a decade filled with looking forward, uh, horizons of all kinds of things new and so on. What she shows, though, is that um, his appeal waned about 1971, 72, precisely because there was just so much violence and polarization in the United States, just a lot of despair. Frankly, uh, 1972 looks a lot like uh, 2022. Um, and because people had read Teilhard through a very particular lens, uh, I would call it unbridled optimism, just in, in enthusiasm for all kinds of futuristic things. Well, you know, by 1972, and this is actually before the Watergate impeachment uh, proceedings, the, the loss of Vietnam, uh, that he just didn't seem that believable anymore. So what Teilhard really represents for me, especially in light of her wonderful book, is what happens when we repress or we forget one half of Holy the Firm. Uh, when we're all for the optimism of day one, which is how Teilhard was read in the 60s, but we leave out or ignore that other negative pole, the apophatic pole of day two. And this really was a misreading of Teilhard because there's a dark side to him. I mean, this guy survived the Battle of Verdun, one of the worst experiences in human history. So he wasn't a fool. And um, essential to his vision really is two poles, divinization of activities, which we all like, and the divinization of passivities. And we're less keen on that. And for Teilhard, this is really essential, that suffering of all kinds including sickness and diminishment and death, um, these two need to be divinized as we are moving toward the future. So I would love to see in response to a number of the 
questions that have been asked, a revival of Teilhard, that cosmic infinite horizon, um, which is also Rahner, uh, the forward thrust and all that. But, you know, I think we, we should also just remember that we should read him in a, in a day three way. Um, Tarot is both. He is both that optimism visionary and he really understands Dillard's day too. That sense that uh, the material world you know, it's just filled with accidents, as we saw today in the uh, in the presentation, and um, you know, all kinds of an unanticipated things. I I think if we read Teilhard as he himself was, and I think I saw Frank uh, Frost here visiting, making that wonderful movie. Um, he's about wonder and awe, and that's always going to include. The strange, the foreign, the other, uh, it pushes back against us. It's what we can't comprehend or control. Um, and so that would be a more, let's say, mature reading of Teilhard, a more adult one than, than we had in the 60s, which was exuberant, but then uh, sadly he did, he did fade into some, some kind of obscurity. Um, yeah, Steve. Yeah, thanks a lot. We'll still work on that video. So maybe it's it's for us just to luxuriate in the the honey baritone that you have <laughs> <laughs> and not have any image. I don't know what's going on here, but like, but it is funny to have this this, this imperfection to have a day two. You know, I, so we're living. I think it's kind of interesting and perfect, in some way, perfect for this talk to have some of these tech glitches. You know, and let's talk about those navigating of opposites because Teilhard, you know if you you can miss him with his nose sphere and his and his uh and his kind of point omega and the beautiful concept of christogenesis you can miss that he's a he's really a hard scrabble realist yes so he, he understands paradox in the ways that you outline so fully and so i have an image here from the center of your talk that really always gets me from city psalm and that's that you know I have seen not behind, but within, you know, so what Jack Hammer's raging, a parking lot painfully a gleam in the May sun. I have seen not behind, but within that. So that is that kind of complex of opposites and the sacramental vision. So say more, if you wouldn't mind, about Levertov's poetic distillation of the sacramentum at rest, maybe about apophatic and cataphatic theologies, maybe about paradox and how we might apply that or think about that, you know, in this time that you so rightly name is very similar to those convulsions of the sixties and seventies. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I read across that poem many years ago. I think it was in the seventies. Uh, um, in the Norton anthology that Levertov had edited, and I still have that really dog-eared uh, copy. And so I am sort of a child of the 70s, and uh, it's all very close to home for me. What really struck me at that time, and then I think it really applies to today. Uh, so for Levertov, she's not waiting for something to come. It's not going to be a time that comes when this all gets fixed. She's, she's just acknowledging where it is, what's happening. It's brutal. It is Annie Dillard's day two. And yet it's in that that she has the vision. It's in the midst of it. And what I like about it for our year, 2021, uh, where we are waiting, and we have been waiting for a very long time uh, for certain things to change. Certain things will change. Obviously, the pandemic will move on. But it's becoming very clear with a lot of the side effects, including uh, the, the massive strikes and the supply chain and all this business, that we're in a different place. We are now, I think we'll be there for a while. 
And what I think Levertov's particular sacramental vision does for us is by keeping them united, she says, look, here, here's the outward stuff, and there's no denying it. But if we think sacramentally, or another word, just incarnationally, that it's in that that we're going to see that what we're looking for, we're going to, we're going to have our vision. Uh, if there is a paradise to be seen, it will be seen in the dust of the street. Uh, to me, this is, um, this is real hope. It's not optimism. It's not uh, an unjustifiable um, positive outlook, let's say, but it does move beyond despair. And, and it's not waiting. It's right here. Um, I know that kind of vision. It comes, if it comes at all, I suppose, it comes as uh, unexpected, unmerited grace. Um, but it's something I think we could all hope for. Um, yeah. 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 You know, uh, it, is, it clings on kind of maybe an Americana of a kind of a, ceaseless progress or a kind of Whiggish utopianism. And, you know, it does, and it, and it really does retrieve it in a kind of a spiritual calculus. Let me, let me integrate a question here from Cynthia Wallace, a great scholar. Uh, one of her, uh, her essays, uh, one of her essays, <laughs> excuse me, in our Levertov book uh, from our conference, Cynthia has a great essay in that book. And she's on this point, I think, that you're making, Steve. And she says she loves how, um, she loves how to move toward Caroline Bynum's attentive, wondering care. She loves that. This emphasis on attention, she writes, as you know, is an undercurrent in both Levertov and Dillard. And all three of these thinkers encountered an ethics of attention in Simone Weil. So I'm wondering, asked Cynthia, if you could expand your thoughts on this ethics of attention uh, in our contemporary context, in teaching, in politics, in social and political conflict in reading. And maybe we're really tapping into you as a historian here, Steve, again. Well, I just want to thank Cynthia for such a wonderful synthesis. Yes. Um, I forget which poem it is exactly now, but Levertov's meditation on what it is to be president, to be attentive, and also how that kind of, you know, comes in and out for all of us. Uh, and Simon Bay, yeah, I mean, just going way back to my studies in, in French Catholicism. Um, what I like about her question, I think it really helps focus what I think the end game of this lecture is uh, for me. Um, you know, when I think about Pope Francis, I think about what are we going to do about the future and all of this? There are so many programs and uh, projects that we could have, but I think it has to be something a little more radical. I think it, it has to be a different way of looking at the world. I think that the projects and sort of getting a little tired. Uh, and I think maybe we're feeling some kind of collective exhaustion. So when we think about Bynum, she is doing this in 1997. It really is the heyday of deconstruction. There's just a new, wonderful uh, new history, intellectual history of deconstruction that came out last month in the United States. And I thought it's kind of funny because it means it's historical now. <laughs> we look back and we can talk about it as a historical epic. Um, and so her concern at that time was the kind of flattening presentism that came out of that mode of thinking. We go in, we take something apart, we, we look at where the power structures are there, and then we, we have the parts there and we just kind of leave it on the floor, dissect it, and we understand it, we comprehend it. And Bynum in 1997 was really working against that. And she's saying, no, we really need to recover a sense of we approach the other in its particularity, and we're blown away by that. And we spend time with it, to go to Cynthia's point. We, we, um, we pay attention to it. What I'm struck by revisiting Bynum in our current 
Peltras. First of all, it is something, isn't it, that she basically wrote 21, 22, actually 24 years ago. We need to educate a new kind of student. We need to educate a new, really, a culture. And what's kind of sad to me is we haven't. Uh, we, uh, it's not, we, we don't live in the same deconstructive culture that we did in the 1990s, but we do live in one in which we can take one or two notes of something and then we can dismiss it. Oh yeah, I got it. You know, I figured out what category that goes into and I label it and I put that on the shelf or in a box or, you know, something. Mm -hmm. When I think about the tasks that lie ahead of us now, and I do think really post COVID will be a stronger cultural challenge than people are thinking. I think people think it's going to, a certain normality is going to come back. And I'm not sure that's really true. This, yes, and an ethics of attention. Um, I noticed one of my former colleagues from Boston College uh, is on here, Ginny Reinberg, uh, Reformation Renaissance. And of my many, many colleagues over the years, I think no one really gave me such an appreciation of the particular as Ginny. Uh, and to my own propensity, having basically done my earlier grad studies in philosophy, to my own propensity to, to go to the abstract category, to you know, fit things in, to make sense of them, uh, I, Ginny really helped me look at things as a historian and be just blown away by the irreducibly particular spatio-temporal located uh, object. And if there is an end game to the lecture and to entering with Bynum that way, yes, it's to encourage more of Let's be slower. Yeah. Let's be slower. You know, William Lynch's great yeah. line. Yeah. Be slow to move from the many to the one. He's yeah. always emphasizing. Yeah. And so how would, so that's wonderful. And I, I love the meditation there, but see, there's this, it's almost like a categorical tension because we are worried about the tyranny of the immediate that makes its demands. Yet we want to be particular and slow. Can you add a further distinction there? And really, there are some questions. Larry Fisher has one uh, about William Lynch. And then someone else has come in here. Um, who is it? It's someone on, uh, sorry, I'll get the name, but we have a couple of questions on Lynch. So how would you, again, uh, distinguish between a tyranny of the present or the immediate, and then giving the particular its due in a, in a slowness? Uh. Great question. Not sure I have a good answer for it. Yeah. So when I think of the tyranny of the present, I think of uh, the device that pings and then yeah. the person feels I need to go attend to this. And then some outrage of the second shows up and then my blood boils, but then comes the next ping. And so I move on. This is not attention. Uh, this is a very different idea of the present. And I, I appreciate your question because present and presentism, you know, they could easily be confused. Uh, I think the device needs to be put down. And I think the self needs to step back and reframe whatever it is that is in front of me and pay some attention to it. This business of uh, successive jolts of energy and attention getting, uh, to me, this is exactly the opposite of what is meant by uh, what Bynum is saying, what Simone Bay is saying, uh, and so on. Thank you. Very good. This is uh, a question from, I, I think I've met Steve before, Father Stephen, uh, and I, forgive me, is it my Lou? Oh, my French is terrible, Steve. But from Loyola Marymount University, I believe, 
Um, and he writes a question about Pope Francis and says this, or asks this, uh, in terms of Pope Francis's Jesuit influences, is there a tension between an openness to paradox, you know, with Henri de Lubac, and a desire for dialectical resolution as in facade? If so, is that tension positive or negative in terms of future possibilities uh, for our hyperpolarized politics? It's a great question, Steve. <laughs> Steve and, you. and welcome from Los Angeles. Well, you know, so this has fascinated me because, uh, yes, Fassar being a Hegelian, he was big on there is eventually a synthesis. I've been really struck by how much Pope Francis seems to be in no hurry to reach any synthesis at all. And this is why the invocation of Henri de Lubac really, really struck me that he would have noted him in the last month. And I think this is what just drives people crazy about listening to Pope Francis, because he's quite willing to let out, okay, we have this over here, let's say group A, and we have uh, group B here and doing it. And he says, okay, get together, do this synod thing, talk it out. He is not overly concerned about an outcome. I don't know if this is an intellectual conviction or a very deep faith. <laughs> I just have never really figured it out, but I've been struck over and over by how he he doesn't seem to feel any compunction to bring that to closure. So when Steve makes the point about our present day <clears throat> political circumstances and where it seems that we have all of these tensions and um, will they ever be resolved? Is that in the Pope's mind? I'm not sure it is. I, I, and I could be totally wrong. It's not like I'm a great expert on him, but it seems to me that he has a faith, as did uh, Guardini, that, and I should also say Carl Jung, um, that holding those intention will itself be productive of creative novelty, but they won't be resolved. I could, yeah, you know, th I could really be wrong, but I'm just. Yeah. No, no, I, I think, you know, it's, it's normative teaching, actually. It's actually a very uh, Thomistic. I mean, Thomas, uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas loved the tensions. That's where things got real for him, uh, more, than, more than the scholastic kind of uh, cartoonish caricatures may have given, uh, given us there in the uh, in late uh, kind of late, late enlightenment thought. Um, but you really get me thinking, too, and thanks, Steve, for the question from our friends at Loyola Marymount. Uh, about these, about the tension and about faith and about paradox. So if you have someone like Einstein, he'll say no problem worth solving was ever solved in the plane of its original existence, hmm. right? That's level one. Hmm. Someone like Nicholas of Cusa on paradox will say, yeah, the paradox resolves, but not, not on your plane, right? It's, it might be more of like a, like a Teardian plane. And that's tough for humans to take because, you know, finite human reason and wants wants to control things so i don't know though like because this is where i get into a jam about politics and maybe this is your you know because you're you know you can get we all can get abstract and excarnate and we want to have some practical solutions that this tradition can bring so if we're if we're making for the mountain what does that mean is that like a, is that some kind of feckless benedict option where we run off to the hills and, and we wait we wait it out or can we have more of an Ignatian option and enter into the cities? Um, well, can I can I give two uh, two examples? Oh, please do. One, one, we in my in my view, we really um, we really operate out of a lot of presumption. So uh, let's take any doctrine. Okay, let's take Christ has uh, two natures. One person, two natures. And going back to that old uh, prof's diagram of the, uh, the ball in play, uh, what is orthodoxy? It's that Christ was fully human and Christ was fully divine. That's it. 
what does that even mean, really? <laughs> it doesn't resolve. There is no synthesis. You can't understand it or comprehend it. All you know is that you have two things. They must be held in tension at the same time. And all you really know is when the ball goes out a little too extreme on one or the other sides, that's kind of over. It's not easy to hold two things in tension at the same time. No. A second uh, example, so that's a theological example. A second one is, I don't know if you read two days ago in the New York Times, a lovely, uh, very moving, uh, very moving essay uh, by, um, I, I believe it's a professor at Brandeis talking about the origins of the Thomas Jefferson statue oh. in New York City, which was just removed. And why was it removed? Because it was seen as, it was labeled as, this is a statue to a slaveholder. And the professor from Brandeis laid out its history. It was actually donated by a Jewish immigrant who made money and had sufficient money to, to put that up. And he did that and he also, I think he bought Monticello <laughs> in the early 20th century to keep it up because it was in such a, such a bad way. He was devoted to Jefferson. Why? He was Jewish. He was a religious refugee. And he had come to a country in which that was, he was okay here. It was okay to live. What I love about that story, and I just taught a, a unit on the contestation of statues two weeks ago, so it's really on my mind, um, that all statues are always contested. They, they look unitary, but pe what people are investing in them are often totally at odds. They represent different communities. And I thought, I wonder if it's possible in our culture to to hold both of those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. To think of Thomas Jefferson as, yes, a slaveholder, and also the architect of a constitution and a country in which a Jewish refugee from pogroms abroad could come and find liberty. So I don't think this is as abstract perhaps as we're making it, but what, what would have to happen is we'd need to be able to entertain both of those things at the same time, hold them in tension, and who knows where that goes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, really well said. You know, I, so to speak in terms of your talk, it might be that in our, in our divisive political culture, which might just be what human culture is, we want to live in day one or day two. Yes, yes. And so it becomes puritanical, doesn't it? If one's one's not, you know, with the day one crowd, and you know, you're in the day two crowd. And you know, the mark of a good education, a good liberal arts education in the Jesuit Ignatian tradition and elsewhere, was always the mark of being able to dwell in those ambiguities, not in some uncourageous way, but to understand those tensions. I'm just going to read here what one of our viewers has just typed from a quote from Teilhard. And maybe that'll be our second to last thing before I give you one more question, Steve, but it's, it really is quite great. And I wanna make sure I have the person right. And that's, um, I think, Teresa Birch. And, she, and here's what Teilhard writes. Nothing is more beatific than union attained. Nothing more laborious than the pursuit of union. For three reasons, at least, a personalizing evolution is necessarily painful. It is basically a plurality. It advances by differentiation. It leads to metamorphosis. And that's it. That's from On Suffering from Teilhard. Uh, magnificent. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Well, and it is. And, and, and you know, it brings up a, a very famous quotation from Teilhard that shows up on a lot of uh, posters and Hallmark cards and stuff. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to forget the words now, but it's uh, it's to be patient mm -hmm. and to be patient with yourself because 
yeah, things don't make sense, da, 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 but, the, but the Lord works over the long haul. What I like to say to students about this is I, I love it. It's a beautiful quotation. But we have to remember that when Teilhard is talking about <laughs> working over the long haul, he's a paleontologist, right? I mean, the, the average unit of measurement is like 10,000 years. <laughs> and then it goes up. He's very into the slow, patient process. And part of it is the nature of his scientific background. And he's also just really aware. And I like, it's one of the reasons I like using those fossils at the beginning. I love Patty on Rogers's poem. Yeah. Uh, to be aware of time, time and its demands and what it erodes. Um, so that's a wonderful quotation. Thanks for that from his book on suffering. Yeah, Teresa. Um, and really, if we think about since maybe 9-11, but really probably with the advent of, um, you know, the digital revolution, the time is, is different now for a, a lot of us. Uh, and so to be slow is very difficult. Um, and then Laura, I think Laura here has given us that quote, Steve. It, it's uh, this is Laura uh, Elo. Sorry if I have it wrong, Laura. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah. Wonderful. And let's close with uh, thinking about young people on, on the advanced questions. There were several that were saying things like asking things like, how can we have the work of Teilhard, you know, uh, be realized and appreciated by, by young people, but then also things like how can the Catholic intellectual tradition be, I don't know, taught to be more, more, um, you know, more of a, of a, you know, as a draw to young people, pardon me for uh, stumbling there, but you know what I'm saying here, is, is there, you know, what's up with Generation Z? Is there wonder and awe to kind of use your language, right? The very last thing you say is every view of things that is not wonderful is false. Do students still get that? And how can we help with our, with our traditions? So, uh, as you know, because the Hang Center sponsored it two weeks ago, and you were the uh, facilitator, there was that wonderful meeting with a number of the young faculty from the philosophy department, um, and it's on the web. I do encourage folks to, to check it out. And I think it was Naomi Fisher, if I'm correct, Dr. Uh, Fisher, who gave that beautiful uh, example of the student in her class really just expressed a great deal of uh, depression um, and saying, we live in a totally determined world. What is the point? Uh, it was a you know, kind of cultural despair. And of course, we really see this with echo despair, which has become a very common um, phenomenon. So uh, I, I don't want to think of Carolyn Bynum as frosting on the cake. I think what she is asking us to do is the essence of religion. Now I realize I'm, I'm starting to speak like a very old man. <laughs> and as each year goes by, I feel that more and more. I increasingly, I feel, what is the point of religion? And I don't have anything against moralizing or ethics. I, they're very important. They're what we build society on and all that. But what is it about? It's about standing in wonder and awe that anything exists at all, which I might add is one of Levertov's poems, yeah, right? Yeah. That anything exists at all. And to be filled with that kind of amazement is what, it feeds me. I don't know whether it feeds. Um, I don't know whether it feeds other people. You know, a, a really simple book that I I love to use to explain what I'm saying here, because I think Carolyn Bynum can seem a little lofty. You may know Ross Gay's Book of Delight, and it came out whatever it was last year or the year before, and beautiful interview with him on, on being with Krista Tippett. And he set out one year, every day he was going to journal a delight he had encountered that day. And some of them are pretty wild. 
Some of them are, you know, kind of normal. Some of them are pretty. Some of them have a lot to do with some kind of uh, uh, racial affront that he encounters. What I think is wonderful about that book is, and everybody, you know, just got rave reviews, is that it brings us back to this. Are we able to practice that on a daily basis, that we would consciously seek out where's, where's the strange, where's the foreign, where's the delight, where's that complex of particulars that is just, uh, at, at one time, it's just grabbing my attention, and at the other, I'm, I'm kind of blown away by it. You know, I'm, I'm, there's a little bit of distance because I'm so amazed by it. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know. I, I feel sometimes when I give talks and stuff that I, I might be just totally not engaging where people are. But I feel so often people are looking for solutions, mm -hmm. yeah. pro problem solved solutions to projects that they have. And I think the ethical, the moral is a very, it's important, but I, I keep going back to the metaphysical because for me, yes, but we will always have those problems. Mm -hmm. But can we live in them in the way that Levertov does yeah. in that poem? Can we? Can, can we be so amazed by something that's not behind, but within it, that we can, we can be fed. And to me, going forward, I'm, I don't really believe much in a lot of problem solving. We're doing it all the time. We are always trying to solve. What we're not doing, really, I think, is paying much attention, um, which I think is that's what yeah. feeds us. That's a few, yeah, Steve. They, I mean, I just right there with you. Maybe I, I just you know, I've always respected your work. You know, a lot of the stuff on the Catholic imagination, you know, really important in those late '90s at GTU. Uh, maybe people on the call know that. But you know what you've done? You brought back in metaphysics here, and you really brought back in Jacques Maritain and his wonderful distinction of between mystery and problem that he outlines yeah, in, a, mm -hmm. in a preface to metaphysics, and you know you're talking about mystery and these are, these are different registers. And, and so it's wonderful for us to, to be able to think about, you know, you can solve like a murder or a, or a robbery. That's, that's not mystery. That's a solvable problem, but things like suffering and, and wonder and forgiveness and joy, those are, deepening mysteries that, that, that we get by penetration and they're inexhaustible. I like to conclude this, what has become a radio hour. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. I <laughs> no, I think it worked out great. But I, <laughs> you know who I saw on the call, um, Steve, is our mentors from Stanford, um, Alan Barber Jelpe. Oh my gosh. Oh, how wonderful. I wish I could unmute them, but um, but I think what we can do is, I think I'll do this, Steve. So I'm gonna um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna take us out with a poem. I do want to thank you for your preparation, your excellent teaching. Those slide the slide deck's amazing. We promise we will send the video. We'll post the video with no mistakes, so you can watch uh, viewers. You can watch this again. Steve and I might do an overtime thing where we talk more about this. Maybe bring another voice in. We'll see. Um, uh, can I, I, yeah. Can, can I just say, um, so before you end with your poem, which yeah. I look forward to. Yeah. Uh, and following on that wonderful uh, passage from the book on suffering, uh, here are some lines that I went and dug up when I had read the anticipated questions. Uh, they're from the writings in the time of war. Uh, I believe this is from the edition of that edited by Ursula King. It's the Orbis edition of the Spiritual Masters Teilhard, and it's on page 51 exactly, in case you want to look it up. So this is what I mean by there's a way of reading Teilhard that represses his, his awareness of suffering, and then there's a way of reading him that just brings it all together. So um, 
He says, um, it's a blessing. Uh, the paragraph begins, blessed passivity. So then he says, I bless the vicissitudes, the good fortune, the misadventures of my career. I bless my own character, my virtues, my faults, my blemishes. I love my own self in the form in which it was given to me and in the form in which my destiny molds me. And then here's a line which actually, uh, in Annie Dillard's seeing, some people may recall this, she uses the same line, which I think both of them are getting from um, Therese Descaru, uh, Moriac. What is more, I strive to guess and anticipate the lightest breezes that call to me so that I may spread my sails more widely to them. There it is, both poles. Day one, day two, day three. I love that. I love that passage. So glad you read that. Just beautiful. There's a great symmetry here. I think Denise Levertov will help us close too. So maybe we'll do this prayerfully. And and it's the primary wonder by Denise Levertov. Days pass when I forget the mystery. Problems insoluble and problems offering their own ignored solutions jostle for my attention. They crowd its antechamber along with a host of diversions. My courtiers wearing their colored clothes, cap and bells. And then once more, the quiet mystery is present to me. The throng's clamor recedes, the mystery that there's anything, anything at all, let alone cosmos, joy, memory, everything, rather than void. And that, O oh Lord, creator, hallowed one, you still, hour by hour, sustain it. Thank you all for attending. Again, we'll have some afterlife on this. Father, Dr. Steve Schlesser, thank you so much. Blessings on a good evening, everybody, and take, take good care. Good night. Thank you. Good night.